Shakti, and I, I actually, uh, I want to express my, I mean, my, my gratitude and happiness. I mean, my thanks to Plum and my M Fine. I'm part of the M Fine team also, so that is how I got into this. So I'm thankful. See, I always see this these opportunities as as very precious because the it's not like we are educating uh, ten people or twenty people or fifty. See, out of this fifty, some four, five, ten people may actually end up following these things uh, uh, very strictly, adhere to these things very strictly, and they even start. It's like a chain reaction. It's like exponential. A lot of people they start educating, they they start doing, adopting these things in their daily life, and then it becomes a change. See, they go and tell their, uh, I mean, they go to home, they go home and start telling them what they listen to, and then they start uh, discussing this with their friends, their family members. So it it starts multiplying. So this education, it's all about educating and uh, awareness. It's all about education and awareness. Prevention of heart disease is essentially awareness. That's why actually we celebrate a World Heart Day, something called World Heart Day every year. But I think these small sessions are very crucial. I have been doing a lot of these sessions at multiple places and to various organizations, various groups of people, including police, lawyer, and so many people. So I think it's a very useful session. Although it's uh, the fag end of the day, I think it's still, we'll have an interesting session, I'm sure. So let me um, start off showing some interesting slides. So, So I would like to call this towards a healthy heart. Of course, we, we discussed whether it should focus men, women, or but probably it, it, it applies to all. It applies to all. It's, it's just, it's not gender specific, but it applies to all. But still, men are definitely all over the world, irrespective of race and uh, this geography. They are generally men are more prone to heart diseases. And they are the ones who, particularly Indians, they are, they are known to have early heart disease. Now, how big is this problem? How serious, how big it's, what's the global outlook and what are we staring at? In fact, you may be surprised to know that the cardiovascular disease per se accounts to more deaths than all these major killers put together like stroke, lung cancer, breast cancers and COPD, accidents, all these put together, they don't account for as many deaths as cardiovascular disease. In fact, it's the leading cause among both men and women regardless of race and ethnicity. This is what the global statistics say. So the prevention begins with awareness and that is what we are aiming at today. So what exactly is a heart attack or what is a coronary artery disease and what is a blockage? It's very simple. See, if you can see here, there is a heart. The heart supplies blood to all the organs in the body through what are called arteries. That obviously, you'll all be aware of these things called arteries. They are the ones, they are the channels which carry the blood. And the heart itself is supplied it itself is supplied by its own arteries called coronary artery. If you see, everyone generally is born with a normal artery. You can see that the lumen is very clear. There is nothing deposited in it. As the age advances, a cholesterol plaque starts getting deposited. You will be really surprised to know that this blockage starts as early at, as the age of 15. It is not that people develop blockages at the age of 60, 70 or 80. It is the manifestation that happens that at that age. The plaque deposition starts very early, right from the second decade onwards. Then the progression of this, say if it is a minor plaque, it may just occupy 10-20% of the lumen. But the progression of this plaque depends on various factors and that's what we are going to discuss. Now why should we be worried, particularly Indians? Now what demography tells us, what the epidemiology tells us is that Indians are more susceptible than most of the ethnic groups. You can just see the slide. We are almost an average 5 to 20 times more prone than most of these Hispanics, Americans, Chinese or Japanese. So unfortunately, Asians are in general genetically prone for heart disease, particularly South Asia and in particular Indians. This is all uh, genetic makeup. See, you cannot change these genes. See, as Indians, you, you cannot change your genetic makeup. So that is what is important. And what is uh, very alarming or what we see in our do daily routine practice is that we get the disease, Indians in general come with heart attacks or heart blockages at much younger age. You see an average American heart attack or a heart disease patient, he'll be in the 7th or 8th decade, whereas an average Indian patient will be in the 4th or 5th decade. You can imagine that in the 4th and 5th decade, the person is at his prime. 
He has a family that has kick-started. He's the breadwinner. Things are happening and suddenly he has a heart attack. I have seen plenty and plenty of these patients uh, who, who, who come in the middle of the night with an MI who are very critical. You have a young uh, wife there crying there, desperate to uh, to save her husband. There's a, she's carrying a young kid. This is a very, very common sight for us. And can you just imagine the tragedy that befalls if this patient, God forbid, happens to die? It can happen. See, a lot of young patients die despite the optimal best treatment, despite all the emergency treatment, many young patients die. So you can imagine it's not the death of one patient, it's the death of a family. This is quite common and you might have seen off late that we have seen a lot of young celebrity deaths also. And I think that is the reason why we are here. And not only that, the disease also follows a very severe malignant course. So what, what you should be aware of and what are the alarming symptoms? What should make you approach or go to a doctor immediately? There are lot, see, I mean, many people feel it's embarrassing to go to a doctor at the middle of the night for some vague complaint. It doesn't matter. See, even if it turns out to be a non-cardiac, really a non-cardiac issue, it's fine. But at least you have to rule out, you can just imagine that this is the type of chest pain, which is a classical thing, but 80% of these patients have this type of classical chest pain. You just see the slide. Most of it will be in the mid. I can, I can show you. It will be in the middle part of the chest. Generally, it goes up to the neck and it may spread to both arms or towards the left arm. That is a classical presentation of a cardiac chest pain. They may also have cyanosis, sweating. They may become breathless. So these are all classic symptoms seen in around 80 to 90% of people. But another 10 to 20% of people may not have any of these symptoms at all. They may just have some fatigue. They may have just some giddiness. I Two days back, I had a MI patient, I mean, a heart attack patient, who just, he was working and he just fell unconscious. That's all. That was the only symptom. Can you believe? He just fell unconscious, but there was no chest pain, nothing. He was brought in a very critical stage. His heartbeat was 30. So it happened because one of his right coronary artery had got occluded and it suddenly his heart rate had dropped and he just fell unconscious. After doing emergency angioplasty, putting a pacemaker, he has recovered and within three days, he was discharged home safe. So these are the symptoms which you should be looking at. There may be other symptoms like, see, I, we have seen all the patients, somebody coming with a chest pain here, some vague pain here, some neck pain or some radiating pain. Sometimes out of panic, out of fear, some non-cardiac patients, they keep on coming to us thinking that it's like, I mean, I mean, that's also, we, it is acceptable rather than losing out on the real diagnosis. You don't want to miss uh, a real MI. So please, if you have any symptoms concerning anything related to your chest, please do not neglect. It's not an embarrassing thing to go to a doctor and uh, stand there and telling that I have wake pain, but I am suspecting a heart disease. It's nothing like that. This, please imagine that whatever blockages we know, they just don't affect the heart. In fact, they can affect any part of your body, including your brain, your limbs, kidneys, any part of your body can be affected. So now we focus, we come down to the main uh, topic area, that is, how do you identify the risk factors, what may be your risk factors, and what are the things which are modifiable, which are controllable, which you can do something about, but what are the things which you cannot modify. So please, please remember these risk factors. These, on the left side, you have all those unmodifiable risk factors. For example, if you are 50, you cannot do anything about it. You are male, you cannot do anything about it. Your genes, that is what we were discussing till now. Pre-existing disease and very important is a family history. Family history means suppose your father had a heart disease or something at the age of 80, that doesn't become a family history. If any of your first degree relatives, your siblings, your parents have one of the heart diseases or diabetes prematurely. And what is a premature uh, event? That is something below 50 or below 60, that should be taken as a risk factor. You cannot do anything about these non-modifiable risk factors. But what is important is that you people need to focus on the right side. That is the controllable or modifiable risk factors. This is what we should be aiming at. So I will discuss these things very briefly so that it is sort of an awareness program. That's all. See, it's not that the moment you see all these things, you are going to adopt it right from tomorrow, right from today. It, it takes a lifetime for people to change their habits. It's not so easy, but it has to be done. The management of disease, if at all you have adopts three, we have a three pronged uh, approach for that. You need to make some changes in your lifestyle. Medications are there and invasive procedures. These are the three things uh, we do. Now, let us start with the most important risk factors. Unfortunately, 
India is now the capital of everything. It is the capital of uh, 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 the whole world. All the countries have gone through five demographic or epidemiological phases. You can say that there are five phases of diseases. The phase one was the very old pestilence and the old age, uh, medieval ages, where you have used to have only tuberculosis, malaria, leprosy, that phase. And the phase five, you can imagine what America is in now, or some advanced countries are in. That is non-communicable diseases like cancers, advanced uh, uh, hypertension, heart disease, and childhood obesity. India, unfortunately, is still in stage two, stage three. But at the same time, it is now the capital of diabetes. It is now the capital of heart disease. It is now the capital of tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, and it's the capital of everything. That is very unfortunate. That means we have soon caught up with the Western world. We have caught up with them and become the capital of non-communicable disease as well. I have seen a lot of patients. I every day see a lot of patients who come in 30s and 40s. They just come for a routine checkup, do a blood test. And you won't believe their sugars will be something like 250, 300, 350. Even the villagers who are supposed to be very active throughout the day, they are active. They are not obese. It's not a disease of uh, urban upper class anymore. It's uh, irrespective of the class and uh, economy. Uh, we are seeing that this diabetes has become so rampant. Probably around 20 to 30 percent have some or the other form of uh, diabetes. An average company, say uh, you go to a company of say a thousand people and you just check their sugars. I'm sure at least 30% of them will have some form of abnormal uh, sugar. So it is not difficult at all. It is very important that you detect diabetes and it can be easily managed with a combination of food activities and medications. So please have a mental picture. Imagine that you are climbing, a, this is called a food pyramid. So if you see at the lower, I, I'll focus more on the food habits and other things in the coming slides. The, the important part in the food pyramid, as you go up, you, you start reducing their, you start reducing what you eat as you go up the pyramid. That means you'll be, you are supposed to eat more grains and vegetables, mostly, generally. And the meats, beans, poultry, all this will be on the top of the food pyramid. See, it is easy to say, definitely it is easy to say, but difficult to follow. But these are the very important things. I'll focus this uh, a little bit more on the coming, in the coming slides. Now, second question you need to ask yourself is, can you be having hypertension? Is it possible for you to have blood pressure? Because most of you are young. I think most of you are in the 20s and 30s. So you may feel uh, these slides may be very boring for you, for a few of you. And you may think that, uh, and also uh, I have seen a lot of young people asking me now, even the parents of these young people also asking me, you see, if this boy doesn't eat now, when is he going to eat? It's a standard uh, question people ask. Say at the age of 25, if you give so many restrictions, and then when when is he going to enjoy? When is he going to eat? When he, why should I? Why should he restrict salt? Why should he restrict sugar? I will tell you. I have already discussed the foundation for all your diseases would have already been laid at the age of 15 to 20. So that is when the lifestyle matters. Is it possible for you to have hypertension? Please answer these questions yourself. And many of you will be taking all these questions. These are all the things which are common risk factors for hypertension. Most of them. Most of you, if you are having a lot of stress, especially sitting, sedentary lifestyle, physical activity, consuming two or more units of alcohol, often a day, poor sleep, smoking, or any of these things, overweight, all this means that you may probably be having hypertension. And managing hypertension is not difficult at all. You, you have a lot of armamentarium, dietary advices, physical activity, medications, but it's very important to identify your hypertension. The most important thing here is education. Prevention and awareness is the key. See, most important is aware. You should be aware of certain things which I'm going to highlight now. See, this is the most, this is the bane of today's society. Physical inactivity or what we call sedentary lifestyle. In our medical parlance, we call it a sedentary lifestyle. I'm sure you'll agree that this is what most of us, most of the people now are going through. Now, what is this sitting disease? Uh, uh, recently, there was a, a research made on this uh, thing called sitting syndrome or sitting disease. We have found that if you sit on an average of say seven to eight hours without doing anything, I mean without doing any physical activity, you may be doing, you may be very busy in your uh, uh, sitting and doing some uh, work in your laptop or some. I mean, I mean, your profession calls for that. But then sitting for seven to eight hours without any physical activity, it entails a risk equivalent to almost four to five cigarettes. 
it is equal to smoking four to five cigarettes it's a very deadly disease i'll tell you sitting syndrome we now call it as a sitting disease is just some statistics which was recently published in america you can see it, it's it's horrifying actually you can see that a sizable percentage of deaths are attributed to simple physical inactivity that is what epidemiology has told us so how are you going to manage this i mean see basically uh, there are a lot of professions where people have to sit they have no option they have to sit and do it's not like you can't be you can't be carrying your laptops and be walking around and doing your work you have to sit you have no option you have to find time somewhere in between so that you keep yourself active so to compensate for that there are a lot of physical activities which have to be ad advised so obviously next comes the exercise now this is a very important uh, doubt most of you may be having how much to exercise what to exercise what not to do what really is enough what really is good enough that is what the doubt is nowadays now let me tell you how you should actually walk we recommend we cardiologists we recommend 30 to 40 minutes of moderate activity now what is moderate activity moderate activity means brisk walking the classic prototype of moderate activity is brisk walking you do brisk walking you do but not jogging i'm telling you it's brisk walking that is what we recommend 30 to 40 minutes of brisk walking every day i think it should not be difficult at all most people we have seen all our patients who come there they belong to different uh, professions bankers teachers police every every profession everyone says they are busy all of them say they have a lot of stress in the job all of them say they are busy that is what everyone says but i think getting 20 30 minutes out of your time see you wake up and 20 minutes is not difficult at all just that 20 30 minutes of motivation is what is required for you what you should do is it's not that just you start suddenly start jogging that's not the way to do you start walking normally for say five six minutes just increase your tempo so that your heart rate slowly rises and then make a quick stride full stride with your arms swinging that is when you should be deep, deep, taking deep breaths you should be walking very brisk preferably till you sweat after at the end it's just like an aeroplane going up ascending and then descending but by the time you finish with your uh, brisk walk say whatever it doesn't matter see whether you walk two kilometer three kilometer at the average around 30 to 40 minutes with what is what we recommend the last five minutes should be a slow uh, descent or rather uh, slow pace down so that your heart rate slowly comes down so this type of brisk walking is what we recommend for at least 30 to 40 minutes a day that means even if you skip your weekends also it's fine at least we recommend at least five days a week you should do that means to say 150 minutes per week of moderate activity suppose you want to engage in some intense physical activity there are people who go cycling there are people who swim there some people uh, uh, they go they 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 are, eng they are engaging themselves in a lot of sports activities you can do all those things any aerobic exercises are fine then you need not do 30 minutes even 20 15 minutes of uh, intense activity also is fine but we generally do not recommend weightlifting exercises see that is when uh, the problem all, all these issues have arisen because of that whether you can go for a gym people ask whether it's good to go for a gym see even if you go for a gym concentrate on aerobic exercises and cardio type of exercises like treadmill but when you do a stretching or too much weight lifting that is when you put lot of stress on the heart they are called isotonic exercises and it puts lot of stress on the heart you may have well built muscles but it also puts lot of stress on the heart the heart muscle also enlarges and that is known as LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy. And that is the one which predisposes these patients to develop uh, ischemia or other heart attacks. So that type of exercises we generally don't recommend. Exercise not only has benefits uh, for weight control, it also can bring down your BP without medicines. It boosts HDL, it increases your good cholesterol. Uh, and there are, there are people who ask me, why 30 minutes why not one hour why not two hour i can walk full day so there are people who over exercise over that is also not good they walk two hours in the morning two hours in the evening whole day they are obsessed with uh, exercise that is also definitely not good doubling of the safe maybe one hour is fine but beyond that scientifically we have not proven any benefit so you should understand that each animal each god has made different animals with a different purpose they have a different uh, uh, biology they have a different body structure and accordingly we should uh, do see a cheetah runs at 60 miles per hour but the human should not try to run at 60 miles per hour that is wrong you are not built for that you are not made for that 
so a moderate level activity you you can just imagine how your forefathers your parents your grandparents how they used to be how their life was less stressful it was very slow life was very slow and that's why they were definitely more healthy than the current generation they used to walk if you just speak to your parents or grandparents just ask them how they used to move from one place to another place they simply say they used to walk going from one village to the next village one place to next place just walking that walking was very crucial now also it's very crucial now what we don't do now is you go want to go to a next door uh, shop take your bike take your car to so this is what we do so i think what we miss today is that regular walk and this is what is the most important thing do not over exercise but please maintain this constant physical activity which should it's not a it's not a course okay i'm not telling that this is a course of 6 months course it's a one year course this is how you should be for the rest of your life and i i promise you if you start doing this regularly there are people who can't sit at home even if it's raining heavily because they are so much used to walking they they have a, you, you might have seen people going out in rain also these are the people who are so much used to they have seen the benefits of that walking they can't sit idle at home that's how you, uh, you should all become this is the biggest risk factor for young heart attacks so what we are seeing today is cigarette smoking and please remember it's not that see there are people who say i used to smoke 20 now i'm smoking only one or two and he consoles himself that uh, he has adopted a healthy lifestyle he satisfied himself that uh, he has adopted a healthy lifestyle it is not like that even a single cigarette i have seen a few mi patients i have treated a few of them who just smoke that one that one cigarette uh, turned out to be their doom he, they just smoke one cigarette and they had developed a heart attack every time a person smokes you can see there are thousands of chemicals in this uh, cigarette smoke that you inhale and few of them can cause what is called as thrombogenesis thrombogenicity that means it's a thrombus thrombus is basically a clot it can just trigger the clot me- clotting mechanism inside the heart and you can have a heart attack or a stroke or whatever so the cigarette smoking there are two things and there are also people who are happy that i don't smoke although all my friends smoke um, i don't smoke so that is also not done so it is something called passive smoking that beware second hand smoke or passive smoking also is as bad as primary smoking you need to take professional help if you are unable to quit see if, see if you are able to quit smoking fine please don't console yourself that you are smoking to 20 now it's reduced to one it's reduced to two nothing you should not be inhaling any type of cigarette smoke and that's why smoking is banned in public places because second hand smoking also is not good suppose you go home and smoke your kids your wife people around you will have will have to inhale that uh, toxic smoke so smoking has to be stopped there is nothing like one two there is nothing like second hand smoking it has to be a zero smoking has to be a zero if you are unable to quit you can always take professional help so many patches gums lozenges are available we in fact have a lot of medicines to make people quit smoking okay so it's very important to understand that you should quit smoking this is an often asked question can we take call call can we consume alcohol is it good bad see there have been reports in the journals also there have been reports in the lay press everywhere that there are some forms of wine which are good for health particularly the french wine Uh, it was it's called a french paradox somewhere it was seen that uh, french people had a longer life span and they found out that but some epidemiological studies they found that they used to consume lot of wine so that's how it became a french paradox and they when they actually investigated the thing they found that they particularly consume a specific form of wine with, with and in very limited quantities and that is how this uh, french paradox came from but unfortunately people here they uh, obviously they don't consume french wine it's not available here generally and 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 the limits see please understand the limits so for your reference i have briefly mentioned what is one unit of alcohol of course when people when friends when cats in, sit in a sit on a table i don't think they will sit and calculate all these units but you should remember make a note of this one unit of alcohol is 14 grams of alcohol and how how can you make out it's just a percentage i uh, just referenced here there is approximate percentage you can take a snap or you can just probably have this recording and please remember this is the limit we doctors generally don't recommend alcohol also but if somebody wants to consume there is a limit for that two units less than two units for men and less than one unit for a female probably just one or less than one unit for a woman is what we can scientifically recommend but this is on record we recommend like this but generally during our 
consultations, we recommend not to consume alcohol because it's difficult for people to stick on to these units and to these exacts. They, when you go from, when you shift from beer to wine, from wine to whiskey, you are increasing your alcohol content. The alcohol contents become 5% to 40%. The unit, you take two, one unit of beer, uh, I mean, one unit, two units of whiskey becomes uh, four or 10 units of beer. So a lot of things are there. So you can't be sitting and calculating all these things when you are consuming. And also, there are people who metabolize alcohol in different ways. So another thing, another issue that happens is uh, uh, they, different people metabolize it differently. So some people develop hypertension, some arrhythmias will happen, uh, triglycerides will increase. And you can just see that alcohols are just uh, empty calories. They just get converted. There's no uh, alcohol. If you see scientifically, I don't want to go into the too, too much science of it. But the alcohol doesn't get metabolized into anything useful in the body. It just becomes simple sugar and gets started. It just gets stored as triglycerides or fat. Whatever alcohol you consume, it's not simply metabolized. It just gets converted to uh, fat. So it, we call it as empty calories. So we need to balance your eating habits. And these are all simple things uh, which you're all aware of. Now I'll briefly finish off with another uh, four or five important uh, issues. One is Mediterranean diet. And there are the two important uh, types of diet which we, it's difficult for Indians to follow because our cooking patterns are very difficult, different. It's difficult for us to follow these diets also. But there's, there are two important uh, uh, varieties of diet called one is Mediterranean diet, the other one is called DASH diet. I will tell you the Mediterranean diet pyramid. See, what we recommend is that as you go up the pyramid, you consume less and less of these things. Whatever you see on the top, the meats and sweets will be very, very less. That should be the least. And what you see at the bottom, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, olive oil, beans, nuts, these are the things you should be consuming more. This is how your, this is how your typical plate should look like. This is a typical healthy diet plate. This is how it should look like. Unfortunately, our cooking entails a lot of uh, curry making, oil that is boiled, so the usual questions I get in all these types of webinars are which oil is best. So some people say I buy 300 rupees oil, very costly oil and uh, so I should be healthy. And commercially they are promoted as heart healthy oils. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. I will tell you, I will classify the oils very briefly. This is called DASH diet. DASH means dietary approaches to stop hypertension. This was a study in uh, US, done in US published uh, in UK and at various journals, international journals, these diets are known as dietary approaches to stop hypertension. In general, what they recommend is five to six servings of fruits per day. That's, that's, a, that's the crux, that's the main issue, main pro thing in this diet called DASH diet. Five to six servings of fruits may not be possible for a low economic uh, country like ours. Like in general, what I'm trying to say is it's not possible. See, fruits are expensive. You should also remember that not everyone can consume five to six servings of fruits in a day. And even if it is possible, I don't think people consume so much fruits. Fruits are just decorating everyone's dining table, but you go and hardly eat a fruit. So, uh, so these vegetables and fruits are consumed less, less and less of vegetables. So the pyramid has actually become an inverted pyramid for us. So the dietary guidelines, what we recommend is, the two important things I want to highlight. One is the limiting your intake of foods which is high in calorie, low in nutrition. What is that? Like say soft drink, candy, junk food. These are all the usual things young people take. And they just, I mean, uh, it's difficult to convince them that, see, uh, say a young boy, say a college going boy of say 18, 19, 20. I mean, can you imagine that he just stops uh, taking all these things? Not possible. But that is what is important. You have to develop these habits right from your younger age and that is what matters. Second thing, what is important is salt. Now, our style of cooking is very, very different from the rest of the world. Now, what we have observed is that the average salt requirement, that is whatever common salt we take, sodium chloride, the requirement is probably around say 5, 4 to 5 or maybe 6 grams a day. That is what is the average human requirement of a salt is. A lot of studies in on the Indian diets have found that we consume almost three to four times the recommended salt because we put salt everywhere. The Western diets are not like this. See, they consume half boiled or raw vegetables. They just dress it with uh, olive oil or they just dress it with some oil. 
but they don't prepare curries like us. See, what is important is that once you boil the oil, all its properties are lost. However good the oil is, the, you keep on boiling the oil. Once it reaches its melting point, once it starts boiling, all the chemical changes happen and the, the quality of that oil is lost. And that's why we say don't take deep fried food or you eat outside and they keep on boiling the same oil again and again and again and, the, and it results in what is called as trans fats. So that is very important. And this is the last phase of the epidemiology, childhood obesity. You can see that even among Indian kids nowadays, you see a lot of childhood obesity. Earlier it was not there. It is now becoming common. We do not want to reach this stage where childhood obesity is very common. See, remember that obesity is it's almost an epidemic. It's extremely common in US and probably in UK also. And childhood obesity is something which is very, very alarming. And uh, we should be aware of that. These are the uh, uh, foods which are rich in cholesterol and saturated fats and probably it's better to avoid it or keep it as less as possible. So these are the oils which I was talking about. There are certain oils which you should be straight away avoiding in cooking. For example, coconut oil, palm oil, vanaspati, ghee. Th these are the things then the, uh, should, which should never be used for cooking. When I uh, say this in a webinar, I, I, uh, many times I get questions or many times I straight away answer uh, without uh, even their questions that there are people on the coastal side in Kerala or say in Mangalore side who are far healthy, uh, who are far healthier than their counterparts here. They appear very lean, but they always use coconut oil for food. And that is why I'm telling all these diseases are not, you can't pinpoint disease to any one factor. So you can't pinpoint to one factor. It's all multifactorial. These are all what we, uh, this knowledge we have accrued through science. So we can only talk science. I cannot quote the example of this person to that and the vice versa. So in general, because it contains a lot of saturated fats, please avoid this for cooking at least. It is coconut oil, palm oil and manaspati. The next level of oils will be monosaturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids like olive oil, groundnut oil, all these things. This also, we generally use it for dressing, not for cooking. And the other types of oils are extensively promoted commercially saying that they are very good for health and it's also shown that uh, everything is uh, fried in those uh, oils and uh, it is shown that you can eat whatever you want using these oils. Let me tell you, if you boil all the oils and fry vada and everything in the oil, that oil quality is gone. It's no more a healthy oil. But that is how our diet is. So we have to understand that that is how we cook and that is how we eat. So we can, what do, what we can do is we can limit because it's not possible. See, I, I, I very rarely seen Indian homes uh, eating like Americans. Yeah. So it, it's difficult for us to eat like that because that is how our cultural background is. So we have been grown, we are used to that type of eating, preparing, cooking, boiling, putting a lot of salt and oil in all the foods. So we need to limit. I can't, I'm not saying that we need to overnight eat. It's not possible to change your food habits, cultural habits. What we need is we need to limit limit the things what you do and there are questions whether we can take fish oils all those they are all healthy or there are even uh, options of rotating the oils or mixing of uh, oils so this is what i want you to remember at the end of this talk you have to know your number and that's not your mobile number these numbers are very very important these numbers are very important these are all very simple they don't you don't have to consult a super specialist a cardiologist for this you can do it yourself you can do it yourself. Sitting at home also, you can do all these things. How you, I will tell you. These are the desirable numbers. What are these numbers? You take a tape, a simple measuring tape, measure your waist. That's all. You just have to measure your waist. Just, just measure your waist. What we recommend is, males should be having a waist less than 1 or 2 centimeters and females less than 88 centimeters. I, I, I hope you understand what I am trying to say. It's a self-measurement of a waist. Waist circumference is what we recommend. Because this gives us a clue as to how obese you are. You may not look obese from outside. But you measure your waist and if it is more than this, that means your abdominal obesity. That means your fat accumulation in the abdomen is more. And that is what makes you prone for a diabetes. Please remember, that's why there is diabetes more in Indians. Second thing, you measure your weight, you measure your height. Both can be done very easily. There is a formula called, you have to calculate what is called BMI. That you can do. It's, it's, it's an app. Uh, you can do it online. It's there everywhere. In your phone also, you can 
install that app bmi calculator you just have to put your uh, in the on the numerator you need to put your weight in kg and the denominator will be height in meter square that's all now when you do that if your bmi falls between 19 to 25 you are normal below 19 you are underweight malnourished above 25 you are overweight if you are above 30 you are obese it needs medical help so what you should aim at aim is to get your waist circumference below 102 for males and below 88 for females please get your bmi between 19 to 25 don't allow your uh, bmi to cross 25 so it's not the absolute weight that matters like it's not like some people say no, no i'm weighing measuring 70 i'm 80 so it becomes subjective it has to be more objective and for that you need to know your bmi and some of the simple blood tests a fasting blood sugar and a fasting cholesterol lipid profile you can just today you can just sit at home and order uh, these tests online there are labs which come to your home do a home collection you need not even go to a lab they just go i'm sure uh, many of your companies also they'll have annual blood checkups and some sponsored checkups will be there they just come and do your blood sugar test they will just come and do your uh, uh, cholesterol levels it's very simple we need to see that your LDL levels, although I, I have written that it should be ideally less than 100, even if your LDL is say 120, 130, we need not panic. See, it, it is all uh, the desirable numbers, but even a 130, 140 LDL also is not a abnormality unless you are a diabetic. So your sugar should be under control, your cholesterol should be under control, and your BP. You can BP also, you can measure, you can a, any of your nearby clinic, or you can have a digital BP at home. So maybe it will be useful for your parents also if you can have one. You can measure your digital BP. So what is very important is that we recommend every adult after the age of 20 years should be aware of these numbers. These numbers are very, very important. And uh, I don't know how many of you are actually are aware of all these numbers. Maybe at the end you can give me a feedback or some sort of, uh, we can just uh, average it and find out how many of you are actually aware of these numbers. But if you are not aware, please do it tomorrow itself. This is very simple as I've told you. Calculating your BMI, calculating your waist circumference, checking your LDL, checking your sugar or a BP. These are the only five things we need to know. If these things are intact, if you can restrict your salt intake, if you can cut down on your salt intake, if you can do 30 minute brisk walking, you have almost prevented major diseases by more than 90%. And let me tell you, this does not cost you a rupee. Is it not? Cutting down on your salt, going for a walk does not cost you a rupee at all. You need not go to high-end fitness gyms and do all those things. No supplements are required, nothing. Just you need to do this. Unfortunately, when we interact with patients and people who come for checkups, when we ask a lot of them, we ask them questions. I, I rarely see anyone who says, yes, they are doing all these things. I have not seen, I, it's very rare to see people who come and say, yes, I am doing all these things. Because these things are not done. And these are all doable. It's not that you have to take a lot of time out, you have to apply leave, nothing like that. You just wake up, just, just spend 30 minutes for yourself. Just spend 30 minutes for yourself. Keep your mobile phone at home. Go for a walk, 30 minutes of yourself. Stay away from phone. So the only thing worse than finding out that you have any, and other, there are people who are afraid to do the checks. What if, what if my sugars are high? That, that should never happen. The worst thing, more worse than that is not finding it at all. Another two, three slides are there. I will focus on certain things which you are aware of, but you may not be doing meditation. A lot of you, uh, many, many of you may be practicing this. Many of you may not be doing this. This, see, sitting, giving yourself some time, sitting alone, see, just go out somewhere, sit alone for five minutes, 10 minutes. It, it, it will bring a sea of change in your way you handle things, the way you handle stress. The, how the body composition, hormonal changes, all these things are well proven. So these things are very important, giving importance to meditation. And the last thing is sleep. This is also very, very important. Many of you may not be thinking that, okay, why, why sleep? Everyone sleeps. What is the big deal in that? It is not like that. Sleeping is not the issue here. Healthy sleep is the issue. You should have a very, very healthy sleep. And... There are a lot of uh, sleep etiquettes, a lot of sleep hygiene which you need to follow. But what is, you can please go through all the things which I have written here. The sleep etiquettes are very important. But what is important is that you, you, you need to be fresh when you wake up. See, that is very important. It doesn't matter how many hours you sleep. There are people who sleep for only 4-5 hours and they feel fresh when they wake up. And there are people who sleep for 10 hours, 12 hours. 
but they are always irritable in the morning. They don't have a good sleep. They are excessive daytime sleepiness. Wherever they sit, they, they start falling asleep. They feel very sleepy in the daytime because they don't sleep well. So excessive snoring means your sleep is not good. That is that you will never know. Only your partner can tell that you have excessive snoring. That you will never know. So what I recommend is, please do not expose your eyes to this radiation for at least one hour prior to sleep. See what happens is whole day you are in front of laptop. Many people don't get time to see, go through all the chats and all the messages. So they go to bed, take their phone, and then start seeing mobile. That is what uh, the current uh, this thing is. So people watch this mobile for say half an hour, one hour, reply all the messages, they see movies just before sleeping. And when they feel very sleepy, they'll keep the phone and sleep. See, what happens is the last one to two hours prior to sleep is very, very, very important. That is when your eyes should not see light. Light in the sense of blue radiation. When, there's, when you see a lot of brightness before you sleep, see, the, God has made everything so nice. There is something called biological clock. There's a clock inside, not a physical clock. Your brain has a clock. That's called circadian rhythm. That's a biological clock. So the clock understands that when you woke up, when you wake up, you should see light. You should see bright sunlight. That is when it understands that today it's morning. And before you sleep, you should see darkness. So that is when after you eat, and also you should not immediately sleep after you eat. You should you should keep a gap of at least so that one hour prior to your intended time of sleep is very important. You have your dinner, say at 9, 9.30, go out for a walk, just some 10 minute walk. See the darkness outside, come back and sleep, but don't expose yourself to a lot of radiation, especially mobiles and laptops and TVs, just one hour before you sleep. You make a routine habit of sleeping at say around, don't eat too much at night also, and make a routine habit of sleeping at say at some fixed time, say 9, 9, 10, 10, 30, whatever time. If you do this, you will, over a period of time, you will observe that you start feeling very fresh in the morning because you had a good sleep. That good sleep is extremely important. So that's why, see, the questions are, why so many celebrities, they were so healthy, suddenly they died. And what are the ways to prevent heart disease? Should you go for blood checkups? Should you take statin? Should you take medicine, aspirin? No, nothing. It's a good, healthy lifestyle that prevents diseases. 90, 95% of disease prevention is through all the measures which I have told you. But 4 to 5% is not in your hands because they are all genetic. They are all those predisposing factors which are not under your control and you cannot do much about that. But at least this 90% which is in your hands are very important. Another thing is, please do not go for all these supplements. Don't use all these antioxidant supplements. Do not take folic acid. Don't take these B-complex tablets for uh, well-being. And females, please don't start estrogen, progestin. I have seen a lot of females starting with calcium tablets, vitamin D, estrogen tablets. Because females have a production of estrogen till they attain menopause. So we have even seen some doctors prescribing estrogen for uh, cardiac pre prevention protection. That should not happen. Routinely taking aspirin, routinely taking B12. These are not recommended at all. And lastly, still we are not out of COVID. So I please request all of you. I'm sure all of you are vaccinated. If someone is still not vaccinated, please take COVID vaccine. Any vaccine is better than no vaccine. There's no need to stop any medication if you are on. And do not worry about any side effects. Generally, they are all extremely common and generally they are self-limiting. And today, it's the era of teleconsultations. Medicine has changed. The world has changed. People are no more just have to go to crowded hospitals, stay in long queues. It's not like that. You can do a lot of consultations. You can do... I, I also am a, I'm a part of this M5 a, a virtual platform, health platform. I do a lot of consultations. A lot of people do... Like my people like you, they do some routine test, upload the test and take my opinion. Consultations. Whether it's correct, see, suddenly they do a test and upload it and they say, sir, my sugar is, uh, say, 200, what should I do? My triglyceride is 400, should I take medicine? So these are the things. You please at least do teleconsultations, which are very, very useful to you. you these are all at least instead of just uh, self-managing, you can always do teleconsultations, sitting at home. Uh, I know uh, most people are busy now. It's difficult, especially in metros like Bangalore. It's very difficult to go out for an appointment. You have to spare one full day. And it's crowded, busy everywhere. Appointments are difficult. So in these COVID times also, many people don't want to go to hospitals. So these are the times you should adopt to these changing uh, things. And uh, of course, uh, all of you are already spent two, uh, almost two years at home. So just now, people have started coming out. 
but covid 19 appropriate behavior is still relevant i think uh, just it's an offshoot uh, that probably uh, we will not be discussing much about covid so primarily i am be ending my talk today highlighting the main point i just want you to take home this message i just want to underline this message that heart diseases diabetes and hypertension although indians are genetically prone are still preventable to a large extent primarily by your motivation and by your efforts your sincere efforts can help in a long way see you have to gift not yourself but to your family also you should gift your family a good health your good health is the best gift you can give to your family members it's not the uh, how much uh, property you have made it's not how much money you leave it to your you leave your children your good health is the only one that is the best gift that you can give to your family members so i think i will end now it's already 8:50 so i can take up questions no issues uh, let us see how much more i can uh, continue with this yeah thank you so much doctor i think that was super insightful and information i think thanks for going into the specifics of uh what we should avoid and what we should take uh, in terms of lifestyle and food etc we had a few questions come in while you were presenting we also had some uh pre recorded questions before the session started so since we ended with covid one of the questions that we got was uh, can covid make inflammation of clots or another serious injuries to heart in long term uh how how can uh, grd and chest pain how is that related to long post covid illness see covid uh, it will uh, i deliberately actually uh, one of the the initial slides were actually related to covid i removed it because i didn't want because that itself would be another uh, session i didn't want to mix up covid in this but having uh, because you already have this doubt i was expecting that you will have a lot of covid questions covid is definitely known to have a lot of adverse effects on the heart we have seen a lot of mi patients see in the month of may this year i have done at least nine covid positive angioplasties that is these are the patients who came with a heart attack like any other heart attack and uh, in our hospital we never uh, you know, differentiated between covid and non covid we took uh, precautions and we did okay although it was very risky for ourselves and our staff but we stood we took full pp kit and we have done in may at least i have done nine angioplasties of covid positive patients so covid can go to any extent they can have heart arrhythmias they can have heart attacks sudden uh, pulmonary embolism they can have clots in the lungs they can have weakness of the heart called heart failure all these things can happen see grd is not directly related to heart it's a different disease but unfortunately there is a overlap of symptoms in grd people can develop this reflux symptoms burning sensation and this is another thing i want to tell here a lot of people who actually have heart disease who have had a heart attack they need not have chest pain they just have this burning sensation from here to here they only have burning sensation and i have even seen a few doctors themselves taking a, some gastric medicine and keeping quiet at home and they are coming late after two days and three days of heart attack it's very common so please do not neglect any symptom which is in this area particularly this chest and neck especially that the one goes that goes here i guess uh, dr aditi's camera or maybe internet yeah i think we can we can, we can continue then uh uh so uh, the next q and a that we are coming on uh is uh let me let me put open um so doctor someone is asking how to oh, i think aditi is back sorry my internet went off for a while sorry work from home boss um so yeah i think uh, one of the questions that just came in uh and one of the questions that were pre recorded was can we reverse clogged arteries without surgery and one of the questions that came with chat was my father is 63 years old and has one of his arteries blocked is there a way this can be corrected if yes how see about the reversal of blockages we do have a lot of uh, studies of imaging studies going inside the heart inside the arteries and seeing there are a lot of studies where uh good medications called especially statins they are called statin high dose statins and good optimal medical management i have myself recently seen a few cases of my own patients who came late for angioplasty they probably had advised angioplasty one or two years back and they came late when i took for angioplasty i was uh, it was surprising and it was actually uh, in a way i was happy to see that most of uh, the blockages were almost 80% reversed it is possible 
that a significant amount of blockages can be reversed but generally the diseases tends to progress so we don't aim at reversing the arteries but a good medical management is very important and regarding the question of uh, treating a blockage yes it depends on the percentage of block the location of the block and how symptomatic he is it, it it may be see there are there are three things to that either you manage them medically without procedure or you can do an angioplasty or a bypass surgery one of the three i think individually we have to approach it got it got it uh thanks doctor i think uh, another question that we got while we were talking about brightness before sleep was do blue light filters work uh no actually you see what i was referring to was uh, i'm not talking about uh, these filters and all are probably from a eye point of view like probably uh, i mean I, i'm i'm only talking about the sleep aspect is not like see i don't want people to be like to understand that just because you put a filter and uh, keep on seeing the whole uh, the computer for the whole of the night probably they are all filters and this protection for the eyes i mean this probably related to eyes not to your sleep I don't think it's applicable for the sleep thing. Uh, got it. Um, and another question. Uh, I think Mekha, sorry, you asked this twice. Uh, is pink salt healthier than white salt? Uh, I think there are a lot of salt companies are promoting that multi-mineral salt. They contain seventy minerals, eighty minerals. Uh, uh, no, see, salt means sodium. What we want from salt is sodium. That's all. so plain iodized sodium salt is enough for us that is what i am trying to say you don't need additional supplements for any mineral except iodine iodine supplementation is the only one that is recommended all over the world we do not recommend any type of supplementation because whatever is not deficient in your body need not be supplemented so you should also see the commercial angle to all these uh, promotions that happen whether it's any any food item for that matter got it i think there are a couple of uh, food related questions again uh, one was is whole milk bad for the heart and what about rice bran oil see that is what i i think we just discussed that various all the oils are good when when used as a dressing all the oils are good when used in moderation and no oil is good when it's boiled and you do lot of deep frying in the oils so i think rice bran oil is as good as any other uh, oil like sunflower oil or safflower oil whatever oil you use but they are all same it all depends how you use it uh, second thing is uh, whole whole milk 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 yeah see see the milk see see you should also remember that adults don't need milk that is the first thing the first thing is adults don't need milk you don't digest milk you can't digest milk milk is only for the neonates the babies Uh, after that you start losing the enzymes to digest your milk so milk is just like a is, is probably just as a pressy body so what we don't want you to do is to have a high fat so what we recommend is a low fat dietary products so what is a low fat dietary product is you know that some uh, uh, milk is available ready made like you have different say nandini milk or so many milks are available they specify there are different color codings for this milk say they specify 2% milk 3% fat 4% fat what you should do is you should take the lowest percentage milk say 1 or 2% fat milk there are people who specifically use cow's milk directly or buffalo milk directly they say they argue with me that no sir i have removed all the fat they say that i boil once and all the cream is removed it's impossible to remove the fat from this because it it's very rich in fat you can't remove the fat so it is done by the milk uh, production companies what they do is they remove all the fat and they make ghee and everything out of it so if at all you want to take milk it is although not required for your body if at all you want to use it use a low fat dairy product maybe 1 or 2% fat i think most of you will be using the similar milk yeah yeah i think that was super helpful um i think one last question before we wrap up is uh I think Elisha uh, asked. There are times when my entire left arm feels quite light and weightless and weak. Could that be a sign of heart disease? No, no. See, uh, only arm becoming weak is not a sign of uh, heart disease unless you are having other symptoms related to chest. It generally it has to progress from chest to arm, and uh, 
it is exertional. See, most of the time it is exertional. Most of the people who have heart blockages, and if she's a female, relatively young, definitely she's at a very low risk of heart disease. Naturally, that's what I told. The modifiable risk factor, unmodifiable risk factor, is a male. A male by default is at a higher risk than female for heart disease till the female attains menopause. Post menopause, the female risk factor is equal to that of a male. That estrogen protection of a young female is lost after menopause. That's why I'm saying there are people who take estrogen supplements. But that is not good because estrogen can cause clots in uh, veins and other problem. So only weakness of one limb probably is not related to heart, especially if she's a young female and non-exertional. Got it. Thank you so much, Dr. There are a few more questions that have come in, but uh, Sri Hari, Mukesh, Ruben, uh, etc. I'll send. I'll send the questions to you and you can answer them in your own time and I'll send it back to them. Uh, so thank you so much for coming uh, on board today. It, I think this was a very important conversation we should have had, uh, we should have regularly as well. So thanks for all the tips and thanks for being very specific about what we should be doing and what, what we shouldn't be. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here uh, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Yeah, I, I, I also, I also very happy to have you people <laughs> in this conversation so yeah i think uh, if you can pass on these uh, messages i'll be able i'll be happy to reply to them individually also no issues hmm? so yeah i'll so, definitely yeah yeah, we'll definitely party, yeah, yeah uh, to just conclude uh, i think uh, there's no need to panic see in the last one month or so we see a lot of panic uh, happening among the people for obvious reasons they rush to the hospitals and uh, that panic itself, they see there's no cure for your fear. Fear itself is a disease. So there's nothing to fear. See, you people should not think that both extremes are not good. There are people who are very much obsessed, always fearful of uh, some disease or the other. They think that I have, they have a heart disease. They keep on doing these packages. They keep on doing echo, TMT every six months. That is also not correct. The other extreme, there are people who neglect, who don't bother to go themselves, check for the basic things at least uh, once in two to three years. They feel that, okay, I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. Nothing will happen to me. So this, this both extremes are not good. We want people to live in moderation. And most of your diseases can be controlled, cured, or even prevented by adopting some simple lifestyle measures. I think uh, whatever I said, I'm sure they're not difficult at all. They're all very simple, basic things which you need to follow. That is what our forefathers uh, were following, and that's what we should be following. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think moderation is key. And uh, thanks again for giving us very practical advice that we can actually incorporate into our lives. Uh, so thanks again, doctor, for everyone who's thanking us in the chat. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you for our next session. Uh, hopefully, doctor will have you back soon for our discussing.